Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Uptown Worship Service. It's hard to believe that this is actually the last Sunday of not only 2019, but really of this decade. So as we've been mentioning over the past few weeks, um, we are going to share some messages of people from this Uptown congregation where we are reflecting upon God's faithfulness, not only this past decade, this past year, but really how God has just been so loving to us. Uh, alongside with that, I know... Um, about a month ago, we preached a sermon on 1 Corinthians chapter 12 about the body of Christ. And we talked about how in the body of Christ, we all have different functions. We all have different giftings and abilities. And unfortunately or fortunately, there is actually a hierarchy of the different abilities and functions that we have. But the difference is in God's household is up on the parts of the body that we think less honorable. What do we do? we actually bestow upon them greater honor. So one of the messages that uh, many of us sent to me via email, I think all of them are going to be anonymous, is also highlighting how certain people within this congregation that we feel like they don't receive as much recognition as we think that they should receive, uh, we wanted to be able to have a moment where we are bestowing greater honor upon them. Before we go into that time, however, we do have a special a visitor here in our worship service. Uh, I just want to um, introduce everyone to my parent, parents-in-law, uh, Jeannie's parents from Philadelphia. If you can just stand and if we can give you a warm hand. And as far as bestowing honor, uh, many of you guys know we, we are from the States. We moved up maybe four years ago. And there is only one person who visited us by far more than anybody else. More than my family members, more than our best friends, and they are Jeannie's parents. They came up, I think this is their fourth or fifth time. They drive up every single time from Philadelphia. It's probably a 10-hour ride for them. Um, obviously, they're more elderly, so driving up takes a toll on their body. But they come up so frequently because uh, they love, I think they, it's because of the kids. They love the kids, they're so cute. But really, it's because they love Jeannie so much. They've been so supportive towards me. Uh, and I just wanted to take this moment um, to just really honor them uh, for their love and support to our family. And, you know, all of us in our Uptown community, especially myself, we've been so blessed by Jeannie. I mean, Jeannie has been doing so much. She works a full-time job. She's also part of the children's ministry. As a pastor's wife, she also juggles many different things. A mother of three kids. Um, all these different things that she does. And she, more than... Her capability, I think all of us, we love Jeannie because of her character and her heart. And a lot of that has to do with her parents who raised her up so, so with so much love. So I just wanted to uh, just really express that appreciation, uh, not only on behalf of myself, but also on behalf of our Uptown community. But at this time, I actually asked our sister Angela to read the anonymous messages of what God has been doing in your lives and also how we can really appreciate other people. So as Angela comes forward, maybe we can just give her a warm hand. Good morning. So I have the privilege of reading um, some of the messages of thanks and appreciation that uh, members of the church had shared with us. Bear with me, there's a few of them and my eyes are not what they used to be, so I'm going to try to make sense of this really small text. Um, <clears throat> the first one is, I am grateful for the newer members that have stepped up to serve alongside our brothers and sisters every week. Thank you all, Praise and AV team. A special shout out to Terry, Marcus, Simeon, and Sarah Misu for continually serving so faithfully. You have been an inspiration to me and the rest of our church community. Don't know what we would do without you all. Uh, we've had some ebbs and flows, but I see God's faithfulness in the way he is building up our leaders in our church. Next is, I'd like to praise Michael Yoon for being such a blessing to our uptown community, not just in his musical talent that he brings to praise, but his willing humility to share and be part of our community. My appreciation is for those whose fruits of labor we sometimes take for granted in our community, not in any particular order. First, the media team, Simeon, Wynn, Rebecca, and Marcus, who put their labor to support and enhance our Sunday worship service with audio and visual aid week to week. We don't see them in action often, but our community depend and count on them to show up and offer their time and talent throughout the week. Second is Rochelle and Natalie, 
Rochelle for taking the initiative to make sure that we set up and clean up the fellowship area week to week. Natalie for always reliably being there for our children, teaching them, keeping them, and playing with them every Sunday with love and joy. And third was families of our leaders, Kathy, Jeannie, Jude, Juliet, Jubilee, Anna, Marcelo, Olivia, Roger, Kara, Susan, Ellen, Joel, Jackson, Justice. Many times they have to double up their family duty as a husband, wife, mom, dad, sister, brother, so that our community can have our leaders dedicate their time and prayer for the church. We don't see their sacrifices in action often, but we know that our community wouldn't be the same without the family's hearts of love and offering. Next, I am thankful for the impact groups of Uptown. Although we've only been together as a small group for a couple of months, we have already become quite close with each other. I believe we've been placed in each other's lives at this time to be stretched and grow outside of our comfort zones, which pleases our God, so I'm super happy about that. I love how opinionated and different our group members' perspectives and thoughts are during our Bible study sessions, which has been resulting in significant learning opportunities for us all. I am also proud of how honestly everyone opens up to each other without fear of judgment or repercussions. Our group members all take turns facilitating Bible study sessions and preparing food for everyone. Although some of us are a bit more shy than others, I am always pleasantly surprised at how talented and confident everyone is when they commit to doing something. Um, our next one. This year, God has been faithful by entrusting us with our daughter Olivia. She has been suffering with eczema, and at times it felt like nothing we did helped her, and it just kept getting worse. In the midst of this challenging situation, the Holy Spirit prompted our leaders and close friends to pray for her. Shortly after, we were given various resources that helped us manage her eczema. We praise God for his ongoing care and love for our family. I want to thank each and every person who quietly serves New Hope Fellowship, who carries the New Hope Fellowship signs to and back from the street. This can't be easy in extreme weather. I want to honor the passion and creativity of Deacon Sonny in making up all the games for each event with great prizes in addition to his consistent service, sending out the weekly service emails, reminding everyone their roles, and just being available in setting up and taking down. I want to honor the quiet, tireless services of the AV team. Praise God for your strengths of precision, consistency, attention to detail, and making each service run smoothly. I praise God for a wonderful praise leader like Terry, who worships like he is only worshiping for an audience of one, the Holy God. His sincere, smiling, humble countenance, even his little dancing jigs, always encourages me to praise wholeheartedly with the same abandon in spirit and in truth, keeping my focus on him and him alone. I praise God for our oldest member, yet youthful spirit, Frazier, who exudes warmth, openness, generosity, and inclusion by his acts, uh, sorry, by his actions, especially to the homeless and marginalized. What an example of evangelism that challenges me to go outside of my comfort zone. I am grateful that God has shown me in the past year what a community of Christ's love in action is like through New Hope Fellowship Uptown. Praying for one another, doing life together, providing meals and childcare in challenging times, learning how to be humble and teachable in spite of weaknesses, confessing sins, sharing meals, keeping accountability, and more. These things I have witnessed, and I am greatly humbled and blessed. Thank you, God, for your demonstrated love, and thank you, each and every member of our New Hope Fellowship Uptown. Love you guys. I thank God for Anna Lee, Ellen Lee, Jimmy Yang, and his wife Helen, Steve O, oh, and Steve Choi for their faithfulness in serving the finance ministry. It can be harder to have fellowship with others when they are counting after service on Sundays. And finally, God has been the strong foundation and cornerstone this year. Despite the winds and waves of the storms of life, he has remained faithful and true to his character. All praise and honor to God. Yeah, maybe we can just give Angela a warm hand. Thank you so much for um, reading out those messages. But even more than that, thank God for being so faithful to us this past year. And one of the reasons why we wanted to do something like that. And I know uh, just even talking to some of you guys before service, you weren't able to send me a message in time. Please keep those messages coming because 
uh, I think our community, we need to know how God is doing incredible things, not just in my life, not just in the lives of the people who are up front here on stage. But as this passage says, to bestow greater honor, God is doing incredible things in the lives of everybody here. And we really uh, need to showcase that as a testimony and as a way to glorify Christ as we just sang about earlier. So please keep those messages coming. Uh, we definitely look forward to 2020. But at this point in our worship service, we are moving forward. And um, we are continuing on in our sermon series in 1 Corinthians. We are church. Uh, the title of this passage, or I'm sorry, this sermon is Love Actually. I think some of us uh, remember the movie Love Actually. Um, and the reason why we talk about love is because... Um, I guess it was a month ago when we talked about 1 Corinthians 12. We have all these different gifts. Every single one of us, we are part of Jesus' body. We are various members, various functions, different abilities and gifts. But Paul says there is actually a hierarchy of these gifts. And it's not the gift of teaching where you get to be in front of people. It's not the gift of healing where you get to wow people. He says there is one gift that triumphs above all other gifts, and that is the gift of love. So we're going to talk about that uh, because not only is it relevant in this passage, but if you think about it, even in our society, love is sang about. It's in every Hollywood movie. Um, so we're going to talk about is there a difference in the way the gospel, the Bible defines love, and how can we truly love in a genuine way? So let me read the passage for us, and then we'll jump into it. But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And again, it's in the context of there is a hierarchy of gifts. And Paul saying, desire the higher ones. And I will show you still a more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but if I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move, remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Uh, like we do every week, we do have Q&A. So I'm not going to be able to go through every single verse. Um, so if there are questions that you have, and again, love is a very relevant topic for us. So I'm not going to be able to talk about everything. And that's what Q&A is for. Text away. And all these messages are completely anonymous. And we would love to interact with these questions during service at the conclusion of our sermon. We actually look at questions as a part of our worship and us really understanding God's heart better. So please do not be shy with the Q&A. The phone number will be in every single one of the slides. Let me pray for us one more time and then we will get started with the sermon. Uh, Father, we just want to thank you that uh, out of all the things that you are, truly you are holy, truly you are majestic, you are so intimidating, imposing with your will, with your power. But the way you portray yourself, the way you define yourself is that you are a God of love. And you express that in so many different ways. But the most effective way that you have expressed that is by giving up your one and only son to die for our sins. Thank you so much. So we pray that as interesting, as relevant as love is, as interesting and as intriguing as some of this passage is, I pray that all of this, all the discussion, all the points would really lead towards us appreciating more of who this Jesus Christ is, what he has done, and the radical love that he has displayed for us. Not only 2,000 years ago, but as Angela read, what you are currently doing on a day-to-day -day basis in our lives. Thank you so much. We pray all these things in your son's name. 
Amen. So let's get back to the text, uh, starting with chapter 12, verse 31. Like I mentioned, Paul says there's a host of different gifts. And most of the people, what do they want? They want the gift of teaching. They want to be in front of people. They want to be able to stand on the soapbox and tell people what to do, so on and so forth. Or some people, they wanted the gift of prophecy. I mean, just imagine having the gift of prophecy. What you say actually comes true in the future. Imagine how cool that would be. Imagine how productive your stock investments would be. You would be able to wow people. You would be able to say, this time this year, you're going to get married. This time this year, you're going to have kids. Prophecy was a gift that the early church, they thought, man, that much, there can't be a gift better than prophecy. There can't be a gift better than teaching. Some of them, they wanted the gift of tongues. And you're wondering, what is tongues? And basically the gift of tongues is as some of these people were praying, guess what language they were praying? They were praying in a language that that individual has no knowledge of. And they're actually praying a language of somebody else. It's incredible. These things are supernatural. And all these people in Paul's church, they're like, I want the gift of tongues. I want the gift of healing. I want the gift of prophecy. I want the gift of teaching. But Paul is saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. There is one gift that trumps all those other gifts. In fact, he says, earnestly desire the higher gifts. If the, uh, I don't know if the clicker is. If we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Earnestly desire the higher gifts. And when he uses the word earnestly desire, the Greek word means be jealous. You're being jealous of the gift of teaching? You're competing after these things? He says, no, no, no. Be jealous. Compete after the higher gifts. And that is the gift of love. It's pretty incredible to think that in God's household, the best gift is the gift of love. The best attribute, the best ability that you can have is the ability to love somebody else. Now, now let's just let that sink in for a second. Because you go to any job interview, I don't care what industry you are in, in law, in engineering, software development, whatever. Your employer, they could care less of how loving you are. They want you to be productive. They want you to be diligent. They want you to be innovative, whatever. But in God's household, in his corporation, what does he look after? It's not your abilities. It's not how skilled or talented you are. He said he wants to know how loving are you. In our households, I'll be honest, I'm a parent of three young children. I know we have other young parents here as well. And yeah, we say things like, yeah, I want my kids, I want them to be growing up with humility. I want them to become loving kids, so on and so forth. But the way we raise up our kids, the proof is in the pudding. All the different programs that we surround, the tutors that we assign, the proof is in the pudding. We want our kids to be successful. We want our kids to be smart, to be well-educated. Love, although it's a nice to have, we won't say that's the top thing for our kids, for our future employees. But in God's household, in his family, the thing that he wants more than anything else, more than your capabilities, is how loving are we? And we're going to explain three reasons why that is the case. Why is God so concerned with our ability to love others? Of how loving we can be. Why is that? And the first point is because God himself is love. Yeah, God is holy, God is majestic, God is patient. But one of the best ways to define God himself, his heart, is he is love. And we're going to take a look at this. And that's why Paul says, even if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, I can do these amazing things. And even as we heard um, one of the thankful messages, somebody can do a special praise and perform musically, it could be brilliant. But if you have not loved, Paul says, what are you? You are a noising gong or clanging cymbal. In these verses, you're going to see a repeated theme. And it's, it's not all or nothing. It's love or nothing. If you don't love, boom, you're zilch. You're a zero. No, I don't care who you think you are. If you have not loved, you can cure cancer. You can do heroic efforts. If you have not, not loved, you are zilch. Let's take a look at the next verse. Verse 2. If I have prophetic powers, 
I can see into the future. If I understand all mysteries, all knowledge, I am super smart. I am super intelligent. And if I have faith so as to remove mountains. But if I have not love, what am I? I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I am the philanthropist of all philanthropists, I've inherited so much money, I have these businesses and I am just generating so much revenue and I give all that up. And maybe I can actually cure world poverty. Maybe I can do these heroic efforts. If I deliver up my body to be burned, and I know some, some of us are wondering, well, what's that all about? And you have to remember, this was written 2,000 years ago. And in order for you to give up your body to be burned, that is honorable. So if you see movies like Gladiator, 300, it's all about not living a good life. It's all about dying a good death. So Paul is saying, you think these heroic efforts of giving up all of your resources, of dying a heroic death. But if you have not love in God's household, in God's economy, if we can get to the next slide. I gain nothing. You can cure world poverty. You can do these heroic things. You can die the noblest of all deaths. Think Braveheart. But if you have not love, according to God's eyes, you gain nothing. Paul continues, love is patient, it's kind. Love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not arrogant, it's not rude, it doesn't insist on its own way. It is not irritable, resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Why is God so concerned with our ability to love? And it's because we see in another part of the Bible... God himself is love. Let's take a look at this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. And the reason why in God's economy it's love or nothing. He doesn't care so much about what you accomplish. He doesn't really care so much about the results that you produce. But he cares. Did you do it out of love? It's because God himself is love. I mean, we can probably reread some of these verses. The verses that we just read, love is patient, so on and so forth. And we can replace it with God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy or boast. God is not arrogant or rude. God does not insist on his own way. God is not irritable or resentful. God does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but he rejoices with the truth. God bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things. He endures all things. The bottom line is, the reason why God is so concerned with us being loving people is because he himself is love. When we think about that, if God is love, then that means that even in his creation, and the Bible makes it clear, God has created everything that we know of reality. Love has a very special place. Uh, we see this in Hollywood movies. Um, I looked up what are the most famous, popular movies. And in every single one of these movies, one of the most meaningful moving parts is there is some type of interaction with love. For instance, Forrest Gump, Forrest and Jenny. Titanic, that one is pretty obvious. Star Wars, the weird dysfunctional relationship between the, you know, Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, the, the, the estranged love. And then Darth Vader at the very end, he sticks up for his son. And look, man, that is so meaningful. That leaves such a lasting impression. Even this past year, when you think about Endgame, the really meaningful, I mean, I think at this point everybody's seen it. So, no? Okay. Well, the most meaningful part is because there are love relationships on the line that are at stake. Uh, I looked up, um, I'm not really into the billboards, but I looked up the billboard top uh, 10 hits of this past week. And most of them are Christmas songs. Uh, so I sifted through the, the, uh, the Christmas songs. But then all the songs have to do with love. Um, what's, uh, what's something Malone? Is there a band Malone something? Post Malone. They have a song. I forget the title of it. Maybe, yeah. Maroon 5 has a song called Memories. Um... There's a song called Roxy. And well, anyway, I don't really listen to that kind of music, but I was looking at the lyrics, and all of them, they're about love. 
You can look at the Billboard hits of any week, and the majority of these songs are about love. And for some of us, we're rolling our eyes, we think it's kind of cliche, but there's a reason why the story of love is cliche, because it speaks to all different cultures, all different humans at every point of our human history. We understand that love is so important. But biblically speaking, the reason why love is so important in our societies, in our relationships, in the songs that we listen to, in the movies that we watch, in the books that we read, is because God himself is love. So when he creates the world, how can love not be a central figure of it? And that's the reason why Paul goes on. And he says, love never ends. The reason why love is a better gift than all other gifts is because love is eternal. Love will last into eternity. And now he's comparing it with these other gifts. As for prophecies, they will pass away. Tongues, those are temporary. Knowledge, those things are temporary. But love is eternal. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to reread all of this. But basically he's saying that when he was a child, his knowledge grew. But then when he sees Jesus face to face, knowledge, the gift of knowledge that all of us, this society, we seek after, knowledge will be obsolete. Because when we are in heaven, we will be perfect in knowledge. Knowledge is, no, we, are, we will know fully, but love is something that is eternal. And that's the reason why he ends, again, the greatest of these is love. And I know for some of us who maybe have more of a scientific background, you're wondering, you know what, love, don't you understand that love is just the interactions of various chemicals and neurotransmitters in your brain. It's all about your testosterone, estrogen, your exotocin levels increasing, your serotonin levels decreasing, all these different things. And yes, that's true. And if you look up the neuroscience on love, it's very fascinating. But who is the one who created our brains? Who is the one who created these specific neurotransmitters to be able to trigger during certain events when you see somebody that you're attracted to? All of this, obviously, designed by God. Because he himself is love. Love is so prominent in our society forever in our human history. But the problem is, and this is where the gospel makes things a little bit different is what is love? What actually is love? Because like I mentioned, um, the title of the sermon is what? Love Actually? How many of us seen the movie Love Actually? The seven of us have seen the movie Love Actually. How many of us heard the movie Love Actually? Okay, so, so yeah, it's, it's somewhat popular. Um, I saw the movie Love Actually. It's, it's a movie that is basically... It traces nine different types of love relationships. It's pretty impressive when you look at it from a director's standpoint, the way a plot is able to interweave nine different relationships. And all of the movie is about how in these different nine relationships, love is prominent. Therefore, the movie is called Love Actually. Um, lots of good stars in that movie. The acting is great. Um, so from a movie production standpoint, I appreciated the movie. I saw this movie with my wife. Uh, at the end of the movie, actually, while I was watching the movie, I was a little bothered. Because I'm like, this isn't love, actually. This isn't true love. Do these guys know the gospel? This isn't the way the Bible defines love. This is perversion, actually, or perverse love, actually. But surprisingly, I turned to my wife, and man, her eyes were glowing. She was like, oh, this was, I love this movie. We should get the DVD. We should rewatch it. Blah, blah. I'm exaggerating a little. I'm sorry, Jeannie. But yeah, you love the movie though. You really enjoy the movie. She's like, oh, it was so heartwarming. But biblically speaking, that is not love. I mean, again, the acting was great. The cinematography was wonderful. The way the director was able to interweave these nine episodes into a unified plot. All those things I applaud. But man, some of the ways that love is portrayed in this movie. Um, there's a rock star who doesn't really know the meaning of love. And the way he finds love is by watching pornography. There is one couple where, you know, they're married. And the way this couple, the way you see love in this life is their marriage is broken because the wife ends up loving the best man. It's like, dude, that's not love. 
That's not the way the Bible describes love. There's another an interaction where uh, a very successful manager, whatever, he cheats on his wife for a secretary. And so the way the acting is done, some of it, it makes you kind of feel good. But the way I just described it, you understand that's not true love. When you listen to Maroon 5, whatever, what do you know about true love? We hear a lot of distortions of love, to be quite frank. But does the Bible, does the Bible, does the gospel, does it offer a better definition of love? I'll let you be the judge of that. We're going to look at a few verses, two definitions of love that are found in 1 John, very short definitions. And we're going to see what does the love of Jesus look like in comparison to the love that we see in these movies, that we hear in these songs, so on and so forth. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, John, one of the original disciples of Jesus, he writes, By this we know love. And he's about to define love. Love is that Jesus, he's referring to Jesus, he laid down his life for us. And therefore, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Pretty good definition. So according to John's definition, is there somebody who actually loved us so much that he would lay his life for us? That's pretty noble. There is another definition. In the same letter, John writes, In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God didn't just send some Joe Schmo named Jesus. God sent his only son into the world. So that we might live through him. If you were with us last week, we talked about what does it mean for a parent to give up their one and only son, their one and only child. It's unthinkable. It's absolutely radical. Not any one of our parents here, I love the parents here at Uptown. Would our first instinct be I want to I raise up my child in order to give up my child to help others? In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God loved us. He sent his son, Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, there is a lot loaded in that verse. So let me just break it down phrase by phrase. And the thing is, with our relationship with God, though God is love, though God created all of creation, so love is prominent, love is central. We chose not to love God in response. Instead, we chose to live our lives our own way. It may not be evil. It may not, it's not like we're murdering people. But we don't want to live our lives in a loving relationship with God. And unfortunately, because of that, if we are not connected to this love relationship with God, then every aspect of our lives, it doesn't feel quite right. Because again, he's the one who designed this all. And we didn't love God. We chose to reject him. We chose to rebel against him. But God still desired to love us. God still pursued after us. And not only did God pursue us with love, but the way he did that is he sent his son to be the propitiation. How many of us know the word propitiation? Not many. It's a pretty rare word. Even in the Bible, it doesn't come up too frequently. Greek word, palasmos, probably occurs two times only in the New Testament. But propitiation, the definition of that is, it is an atoning sacrifice for wrong. You give this kind of sacrifice because you know clearly you did something wrong. And I know in our modern day Animal sacrifice, all those things seem very primitive. But again, this was written 2,000 years ago. Animal sacrifices to the gods was a very common thing. You would take a cow, you would take a lamb, whatever, in order to clear your wrongdoings, your sins. And in the gospel, in Christianity, it's not some animal that you sacrifice, that we sacrifice for our sins. But instead, the gospel is God sacrifices on our behalf. And he doesn't just sacrifice 
an animal, a cattle, he sacrifices his one and only son. And it says, for our sins. Now I know for some of us we're wondering, sins? I'm not a sinner. I haven't murdered anybody. I hardly ever lie. I'm a very honest person. But the way the Bible defines sin is, it's any time we reject, distort, or suppress God's involvement in our life. When we reject, suppress, or distort God's character. Because our God is constantly trying to pursue after us. Constantly trying to relate and engage with us. And every time we don't respond, according to the Bible, that's considered sin. And all of us were in the same boat. By that definition, all of us, we are sinners. Including myself, I'll be the first one to admit. But according to these verses, what is love? Is that despite all these things, despite our God being the creator of all things, he has the right to demand whatever he wants from us. We don't give it. Instead of him punishing us, instead he punishes his son. In order for our relationships to be right with him. And that's the reason why, again, the proof is in the pudding. You heard the messages that Angela read. People who are truly loving to one another, loving our church in the ways that they serve, loving in the ways that they interact with one, all these different things. Why is it that in our uptown community, in other church communities, that there are people who are able to love? It's not because we are good people. It's not because we have good personalities because our moms and dads raise us upright. It's fundamentally because all of us, we have tasted the greatest love that God displayed through Jesus Christ on that cross. I mean, I'll be real with you. Some of you guys heard, I struggle with depression. There was a period not too long ago, I had suicidal thoughts months on end. What got me over that? It wasn't medication. It wasn't seeing a therapist. It was because I beheld a God who loves me so much, so uncompromisingly, that even in my nadir, even in the lowest of my lows, even when I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror, I couldn't even make eye contact with my kids. I knew that our God, 2,000 years ago, historical reality, he sent his son to die for me. And his son lives and his spirit is living inside of me. That is what enables me to overcome these things. I told you months ago. About my struggles, my failures in pornography, masturbation, whatever it is, I'll lay it all down the line for you. You can look into my heart, you can look into the skeletons of my closet. Why? Because in every one of my failures, it screams that I was able to overcome these things, not by reading a self-help book, not by having good accountability partners. It's because I have been so loved by the God of the universe who did not hesitate to send his one and only son. To wear my flesh. I mean, think about a God becoming flesh like his own creation. This Jesus wore my shoes. He lived my life, this broken life. He carried my sins, my cross, died my death. This love is far greater than any love that you'll ever hear. I don't care how nice of a melody that song is. I don't care how great the acting is of that movie. This love is true. It's the real thing. Everything else in human society, they are just faint echoes, imitations. This right here. And as we wrap up 2019, whether you want to look at it from wrapping up the entire year, wrapping up the entire decade, Please, please, Christianity is not a matter of doing a bunch of things. It's not a matter of accumulating more knowledge. It's simply about, do you understand how loving God is to you? And the question that I posed earlier, how, do, how are we capable of loving? I'll tell you, you cannot love like this. You can't on your own. You need to be loved by God in order to truly love genuinely to other people. Man, I have 
perfect illustration that we'll have to wait till next week. Uh, yeah, I'll be honest. This past weekend, there were some relational issues in my heart. And yeah, I could have responded according to the flesh, according to whatever the, the society thinks is right. But I had to really look at myself and remind myself, do I understand that my God died for me? Do I understand that this God who is so majestic, who can easily demand anything, he humbled himself to die for me. That's not going to make these relational tensions go away. But you know what that would do? That's going to enable me to love anybody and everybody. This thing is real. This isn't just some fairy tale that makes us feel good so we can fall asleep at night. This is, we heard it in what Angela just read. And next week... You know, not to constantly do these sneak peek type of things. But next week, we're going to talk about the reliability of the gospel. I'm explaining to you what the gospel is. Next week, Paul talks about, man, this gospel is not only all important, it is so reliable. You want to assess it from a historical standard. You want to assess it philosophically, whatever. It is so reliable. So I really want us, as we wrap up this decade, this year, as we look forward to 2020, man, it's all about Jesus, who he is. And what he has done for us. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, us to rise as we kind of respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing. And maybe the band, you guys can come forward as well.